So we're back, episode 32, the Dan and Inko Show. And where are we at right now? Lord Hobo. Lord Brewer. Hobo. And we know you love beer. I love beer. Yeah. Everyone loves beer. Who doesn't love beer, right? I can't wait. We're going to have a sample, a little sample here of some brews. We're going to take a tour. Samples. Samples. Yeah. But we're going to be responsible like we always are, right? Yep. I'm going to meet another guy with a beard coming in in the show. His name might, might be Dan as well. Might be. We'll see. Would it, would it be little? Dan's twin. Or, yeah. <laughs> Stay tuned. We're going to have a good show. Check it out. I started uh, my career in craft beer owning craft beer bars. So 19 years ago, I opened a place at UMass Amherst, and it was the one place in town that didn't cater to kids. It was adults and grad students. And back then, I was like, I'm not going to sell Bud Milk Coors. At the time, I just seemed that everyone else in the town did that, bitch and pictures and shots. I was like, I'm going to sell craft beer. I was really into Guinness back then, and some other, I started getting into some more craft beer. So I bought a bunch of, at the time, really esoteric um, brewery brands that were coming into Massachusetts, and we, be we became known as a serious craft beer bar right away. We won uh, best beer bar in the country in 2005. So we opened in 2002 and then Beer Advocate, based on the rating system, named us the best beer bar in America. I thought, all right, I want to put world-class IPA on every shelf. And so that's essentially the mission of this place was, let's put a good beer totally available everywhere. And as soon as I walked into this building, I said, this is it. So it's 46,000 square feet. It's a lot more than I needed at the time but I had ambitious growth goals and I figured eventually we'll need the space. A lot of the breweries start too small and when they need to grow, they can't because physically they're constrained. So we had none of that problem here. We were only operating in the beginning in a very small portion of the building. You could still ride dirt bikes in here and hit golf balls and you know, um, shoot bows and arrows for 200 yards. I mean, it was a wild spot back in the day. There was nothing here. Um, since then, you know, we like said six years later, the building is full. We now have the building across the street. So it's been a constant evolution of growth, pretty pretty rapidly. All like the great ingredients and stuff, like you buy all that stuff way in advance as well? Yeah, hop contracts with our stuff bought like futures. You gotta buy them years ahead of time. It's gonna challenge you to do so, but you have to predict how much you're gonna do, right? <laughs> And there's no way to really tell that. Like so six years ago, you're, yeah. Yeah. we're buying this much, yeah, now we yeah. buy this much, and then if we're off by 20%, either way, we give you a pretty. Does, pretty good, does, does hops go bad, or can you store it? In they're that? better fresh, but with their cryovac and kept cold, and so a year or two is fine. Three, four years you can. Yeah. And you can, you can notice a, a drop off in flavor. Uh, it does, at full speed, a 12 ounce, 250 cans a minute, uh, essentially perfectly. And this will run 365, 24 seven, really 364. It needs like one day of maintenance a year. And we'll never outgrow this. It can, we can, right now we run it at about 100 cans a minute to, to not tax the system. Uh, plus our, our cardboard box erector can only handle so much volume at a time, but uh, very happy with this machine. We originally had a small four head filler where oxygen could get in the beer and screw up the beer long term. This doesn't have any of that, so. We just line up all those and have someone run and try and... Turn. This is really, when you fall in this, it really hurts. <laughs> <laughs> Does it label it? The cans too, or you label them beforehand? They come printed, yeah. Oh, they come printed. So we will be able to drink from a tank as well. So that'll be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Tank, not yeah. you. <laughs> not me. Just me. Not me. <laughs> yeah, so, so each each of these tanks holds four thousand gallons. Four thousand gallons times eight is thirty two thousand beers per tank. Wow. Well, you have to take them out and wash them every single night and everything, or in between each run? Yeah, they get fully uh, acid bath between every batch. What would you say 
the total amount of every tank in this whole thing. What do you think, like, all these tanks cost? Oh, they're they're sixty-five thousand dollars a piece. Fifty-five a piece. Sixty-five a piece, yeah. That's that's my that's a sixty-three Impala. Another sixty-three <laughs> Impala mint. There's a lot of Impalas in here. That keeps going. Wow. Yeah, if you drank ten beers a day for a year, you would still have room left. You still have beer left in the tank, and that's just one of them. And we you would have sclerosis of the liver. <laughs> and B three fifty. So the cool part is that, so that is a pretty elaborate canning system for a lot of dough. This is where we keg our beer. It was like a $50,000 unit seven years ago, and it's able to run by one person. And so draft is 50% of our business. Yeah. And it all comes out of this one little unit here. A lot of breweries start with something smaller than this. We started with a 40 and then added that to the repertoire later. So was that the first unit? Yeah, the first tanks ever were on, this, on that far row. What's cool is that um, you can, it, when you're here drinking a beer, the garage at night, the garage is open. So you can walk out here and just, you know, not a lot of breweries, you can see the entire factory yeah, cool. well, with a beer in your hand, you know? Yeah, that's cool. You guys drove it to where you can only walk to like here? Yeah, exactly. You guys wanna jump up on the brew deck for a sec? Good morning. How you doing, Daniel? Good, man. I want you to introduce to, uh, this is Rob Mikovich. Hey, Rob, how are you doing? And Dan, Dan O'Brien. This is David Smythe, one of our brewers. Yeah, so that's actually a hot water tank, a reservoir. So we always have 3,000 gallons of hot water on demand at all times. And then that's a cold water tank. So these are just vessels of holding tanks. What's the cold water temperature? Uh, that's Probably just, just above freezing, probably. Oh, so like 30 something. Yeah. But this is hot. This is almost at a boil. I'll drop it there. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's crazy? Like beer, like the craft beer industry, right? It's almost like CBD. To where when you got into it, when you started doing this, you were like the guy, first person, like starting to do it. And now there's so many people yeah. that wanted it. Like CBD, if you were the first one yeah. to start CBD, now everyone's got CBD. So yeah. like to be able to get in and do it the way you did it, now you're an established player and like one of the biggest players to everyone else. Like you couldn't just come and be like, oh, I want to start brewing beer. Like, yeah. Look at this. Yeah. This is what you got to do. You got to come across, you come against this, you know? Yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, we spent 300000 on the floor. Yeah. A lot of breweries spent $300,000 on their whole brewery. Yeah. Yeah. And nobody wants to spend 300000 on a floor. It's, it's not sexy money. But we don't have problems that you, every other, a lot of other breweries have because they didn't do that. And it makes sense why they don't. I mean, our glycol system, as you can see here, it's 800 feet of glycol pumping through. And so all these tanks are jacketed. So there's two, two, yeah, two layers. Yeah, and then there's a coolant spring around it. And so everything's, everything's temperature controlled. Every tank is cooled the exact, exact right temperature. But look at the farm of plumbing we had to build. So everything's controlled temperature here. So like the building itself. It doesn't matter what temperature, ambient temperature is. The tanks are always the same. Uh, if we ever lose power, which has happened a few times, because once the temperature rises, you're, you're screwed. Yeah. This is a, a hop doser. This is how we dry hop beer. So we add a bunch of hops in here and it pumps it up. And the beer runs through this, like a filter of hops. Cool. Oh. So eventually you'll see stainless steel pipes like these run all the way down and they'll go to the tanks. And so the rubber hose can open you up to a little bit of risk in terms of oxygen. But it's really expensive to bake stainless. A farm of stainless steel is super crazy dough. The, the concern with beer on the shelf is essentially called dissolved oxygen, and you want your DO numbers. To, it's a parts per billion thing, and you want your DO numbers to be sub 10, 20, and uh, as long as you stay under 30, the beer shelf life is really strong. You go above 30, oxygen will eventually destroy the beer. So most of the tanks you see have a conical bottom. Those are fermentation vessels. The beer sits in these from two to three weeks to become beer. And when we're ready to package it, we transfer it into a flat bottom overnight for finishing. 
and that's where we get the carbonation right. So we're actually filling from the flat bottom tanks, but that's where it becomes beer. So these are kegged today. This is Boom Sauce 526 is today's date. You'll see it starting to condensate because it's cold and it's humid out here. Yeah. So these will, get, these will get brought across the street in a few minutes and put away. So we're gonna go across the street. I'll give you a quick tour of that, two minutes, and then we'll come back. Morning, guys. Johnny, his last name is Monet, and he's the money guy. <laughs> Oh. Got here. We got some Trans Yeah, black and gold. I love them. I love Trans too. This is a one owner with low mileage. Yeah. Where do you find this? You don't That's gold. Oh, it's gold. It's, we, call it, we call it peanut butter. <laughs> Inside's peanut butter. This is a stick shift, too. Yeah. We got them in. Uh, Michigan. Yeah, it's this, this guy's company, they do a lot of restoration stuff. They're pretty big out, out west, Midwest. Four, four wheel disc brakes. Big deal. Robert, that's a big deal. I do love myself a Trans Am. Right? So, depending on what day of the week it is, this might be full or empty. You got, we're shipping beer constantly. So this is that, that 12 pack I told you about. Oh, yeah. And so this is the one that's a pain to, to load. Yeah, they gotta... But we sell a, a metric yeah, shit ton of this. I mean, it's just a great. That's a, that's a good thing to get though, you get. Yeah, you get yeah. It's an Imperial Stout, yeah. It's really good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't tried it. Oh, I like that one. Triple I. I think we set up in here. <laughs> yeah, so that's our sixth anniversary coming up next week. This is Hobo Hobo Six. Six sixth anniversary. Yeah, it's twelve percent. Twelve percent. See you later. Twelve percent. So that's the place. Uh, there's a whole bunch of variables that we can't control. So canned beer, for me, is a truer sense of what the beer is supposed to be like. Because uh, there's no variables yeah. in it. No one can touch it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I want to know how our beer is doing in the field, I taste all the drafts because I'm, I'm curious about how that place is doing. But I drink cans to make sure it's in spec. So Lord Hobo is uh, obviously the name of the bar in Cambridge first. And uh, I named that bar Lord Hobo after my best friend. His name is Hobbs, and I have always called him Hobo. And one night we were out having a bunch of beers, and he was being kind of prickly. And uh, I said, you are the Lord of the Hobos. And it just kind of stuck. Yeah. We're going to go over here. And then uh, when I was building a bar in Cambridge, I, I was taking over a legendary bar called the B-Side Lounge, which had gone out of business. And so I had a lot of big shoes to fill, and uh, I like the way Lord Hobo, two four-letter words, it's kind of unique. People are like, what the hell is Lord Hobo? Yeah. But ultimately, it really worked for the brewery because one of our sort of core philosophies is that craft beer is the world's most affordable luxury item. Yeah. And the best beers in the world are $8, the worst beers in the world are $4. There's no $100 beer, $1,000 beer, no million-dollar beer. There's no beer that a... Saudi Prince can buy that you and I cannot buy. So craft is a, the ultimate luxury item because you can drink like a king for eight bucks. And so to me, the Lord Hobo kind of plays into that. Yeah. What if you made a Lord Hobo Elite line to wear? It's $9. It's a $9, $12. <laughs> no. What are the beers up there? Just all the ones that you used to do? Those, uh, those, those mark, uh, so like our, million, our first can, our millionth can, oh, okay. I see it. you know, 10 million, the 4 million, 5 million. This is the number one ever. This is the first one? Yeah. Really? You see how faded it is, right? And then 25 million is here. Yeah. And every once in a while, because they're five and six years old, one will explode. 
and I, I'm not smart enough to lower them, so they just leak all over my computer. <laughs> Once a year I come in, and it's like sticky everywhere, and it's, it's stupid. I just haven't pulled them down. So we're back, the Dan and Nico Show, episode 32, at Lord Hobo, having a beautiful juice lord, juice lord which I love. You've never had that before, right? I've never had this, and I'm, uh, present, I am presently very, very happy, because <laughs> I've, what was the, uh, I'm here with, sorry, we need to intro <laughs> properly, we're here at Lord Hobo with the creator, the owner of Lord Hobo, Daniel Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us, Dan. Um, Good to have you guys. It's weird to be surrounded by glorious beards. So much ginger. Yeah. Even though it's a lot of ginger. Great, you got great, beard envy, right? You know ginger. what though? Like, I, so like you have envy. very nice. You have a very nice like ginger beard, but like this Dan's ginger beard is like swagged out. Like yeah. he's got the freaking diamonds with the <laughs> braids in. Like the dudes rolling with the hat, flat bill, kind of like how I like to roll with my hats on. But anyway, you got I, mean, beard envy though, right? I can't see his arms though, because I know you got the tats. You're tatted up too, but no, you got the tat. I'm pretty clean. Tat, tat, tat. Well, hey, guess what? You don't put a bumper sticker on a Ferrari, so <laughs> you know <laughs> nah, we're Ferraris, obviously. But uh, we had the tour. Um, really, really awesome. I love the story, um, how things just come to be, and and listen when. When you have a successful business and you, you create something like this, it's not by chance. It's by hard work, dedication, blood, sweat, tears, waking up every day and basically bleeding beer. Um, so I guess my question to you is besides beer, what is like another thing that, that really that you love, that, that you're passionate about? Yeah, I think, I think I've always been a car guy. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's why he's on the Dan and Echo show. Because guess what? Car guy, car guy, yeah. car guy. Yeah, I, I grew up in the projects in Everett, and those things always seemed unattainable to me. Yep. And uh, so when I, you know, I'm single and no no children, so you know, I can. There's, there's no one to tell me you shouldn't do this. I, I'm uh, I'm told often, and, and I I kind of <laughs> wish there was to be honest with you because I would uh, wouldn't be so reckless my retail therapy problems, but uh, <laughs> yeah, cars are just, I don't totally understand what it is about cars that um, draws me and draws, you know, a lot of people in general, but um, yeah, I met the first paycheck I made from my first bar, I went and bought a used S4, right one year old used S4, 2000, it was a 2001 car, I bought a No. 2, and it was a six speed and it was 250 horsepower and had Alcantara seats and I was like, <laughs> and I think it was like 30 grand at the time, which is mind blowingly expensive to me at the time. And I drove that car for 100,000 miles until I destroyed the transmission and then I bought a new, newer S4 and I just sort of started that, that journey, that process of car stuff. And, and uh, I've lost a lot of money over the years on them and now the last few years I started to make money on them. So. It's become, uh, it's a passion project for sure. Well, you don't lose money on pure joy. So that's the one yeah. thing. If anyone can take this from Ninko, listen to this advice. If you love something, you want to have fun with it, go spend some money on it, enjoy it. If you lose a little bit, it's okay. What's what, yeah, what's you, the price of joy, right? When your foot hits that accelerator. That's fun. I mean, yeah. That's fun. I've yeah. lost a few. It's like like I, won't get it, I, won't, I won't get into <laughs> like, you know, I might say like, oh yeah, I got my money back. Nah, I didn't get my money back. But anyway, um, so... What do you think when the first thing that comes to your mind when you think Corvette? <laughs> Can uh, I do this? Can I do this? Can I do this? I, oh, why do they make it with fiberglass for yeah. so long? Yeah. <laughs> old, old, man. So, old man. Oh, so you think yeah, old, old man. man. <laughs> I, think, I think just like America. Like, yeah, I think of Key West Key? and the Margarita <laughs> Bill. Yeah. Blue hair. I think, of, shirt, I think of blue older hair. guys with <laughs> you think like, of, you not think too of, many buttons buttoned. Hey. And the, the hair's a little bit too long to look cool. <laughs> but, but, you know, they're pulling it over. Uh, yeah. I think, I mean, uh, Joe but, Biden, but, you know, they'll be yeah, electric. Biden, I, Biden I loves think, Corvettes. I also think it's like he, the, well, he can't drive it anymore. They're going <laughs> to yeah. outlaw Corvettes. A white guy, American dream. You know? uh, yeah, I'm Croatian, but, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think of, I think of, a Corvette as like if you Dan might Dan's is gonna disagree because he'll think like McLaren or Lambo but like when I when, in 2008 when I felt like I had enough money 
to get a car, like a sports car. I had no money at the time. I mean, I was it was my second year. I had torn my ACL. I wasn't really on a roster. I never started a game. I didn't. I really didn't have a future in the NFL. But I made sure to buy myself a 2008 Corvette, silver with red interior. And it was like the best thing that I've ever like. It was the best purchase. I sold it. My dad enjoyed it. I kept it at my dad's house. But I just think like when you're a kid, and I used to go to the car shows. I'd, I'd look at the Corvettes all the time, and. Uh, I don't know. That's just like my thing. I just love Cor- I love Corvettes and I love Impalas. You don't like Impalas either, but I, I looked like at us. How do you not like Chevys? That's all. No. That's un-American to not like a Chevy. Most of Well, I mean, most Chevys aren't even built in this country now. That's that's. I'm talking about like '63. <laughs> you know, a '65 Vet and a '63 Impala were made in the United States. That's all American steel, baby. Uh, but where's the McLaren made? England. That's not American. Yeah, but when I hit that accelerator, that car, that car just sits and goes. <laughs> oh man! And no, nobody thinks like you know. Have you ever seen a McLaren parked in a handicap spot? I've seen plenty of Corvettes in a handicap spot. Listen, you're trying to just because of that bumper sticker comment. I know you're a little <laughs> bit upset about that because those are permanent and they last forever. A lot. I, I mean, they're awesome. I like the the cross, the Celtic cross. I mean, that's because I know your your heritage and. I wouldn't mess with you because the Irish temper is something fierce. But here's a question as well. Have you been like a sports fan? Because I know you you weren't from originally. You weren't originally from Boston, correct? Yeah, I grew up in Everett. Yeah. Are you, so Everett, you're, you're, you're born and raised in Everett? Everett and then Medford, Malden, Revere. Okay, so, yeah, so basically you're no like sure. New England yeah. Oh, yeah. through and through. Yeah. Um, so last year being like the first year in – 11 years since 2001 we saw the Patriots not have a great year and not win a division like obviously you're from Everett and you've been in New England your whole life what do you think about the Patriots in 2021 with Mac Jones and where they're at right now so I mean obviously they load with that they're <laughs> super super deep they load it up and it's been nice to see and it seems like a master plan in terms of cap space and the guaranteed money and um, because the cap came down, I feel like they were able to pounce on opportunistic signings. Um, I actually believe in Cam. I think, you know, six years ago, he was the best player on earth. Might I don't every think, conversation I don't think he, six years ago, I <laughs> sacked his ass. I did miss him a couple times. I don't think he forgot how to play. I think he's had injuries. I, so did Hightower and Chandler. They're still playing. So one like, play. I'm, I'm old man. I'm an old man. I was an old man then. They were young men. You missed them twice in one play. Well, I got held on. Let's not talk about my shit, okay? We're, we're talking to Dan about but the Patriots currently. I know, currently. but that's why you hate Cam Newton. I don't hate him. I just think a quarterback should throw. He can throw? I can throw. You can throw. Well, so we'll see. Okay. So they, they probably drafted the right guy. And Cam has had, had on a redemption tour. He has time for a lot more weapons this year. But another year with the off, you know, with the offseason programming to learn. Well, it's the first offseason program. Yeah, and, and I think COVID, I mean, I got COVID bad, and I was messed up for a while. And Tatum was messed up as an athlete for a while, I think. Cam was probably messed up for a while. And ultimately, if he doesn't perform, they'll put Mac Jones in. And we know he can, with given talents, Mac can hit, make the throws. You know, Whether or not he can read defense, we'll can. see. So I think they're in decent shape. i amazing that Mac fell to them at 15. They didn't have to trade up or down. It's, that and that it's is sort like, of like he, brilliant. You know, it's worked out. I don't think it could have worked out any better. Um, and I think that Cam is on our redemption tour. And I think he will be at least... 40, 50 percent better than it was last year, which is not a lot, but it's enough to win 10 or 11 games. Can they win the Super Bowl with this, with Cam at quarterback? Only if he's materially better. And you're we're sort of based on, you know, getting the playoffs and losing to me is the, what's the point? I'd rather uh, yeah. load up and just. I would rather. I would rather trade up and give up the farm for a franchise quarterback and yep. build around that. Um, making the playoffs and losing doesn't interest me at all. I'd rather be suck for a couple of years, get the number one pick, and rebuild. Now, yeah. obviously, the way they load it up, they're not going to do that. So they think that they have enough uh, infrastructure to go for pretty deep. And I, I trust Bill in the, sense, in the sense that he knows what he has. He knows what Cam's limitations are. And if he feels like he needs to pull the trigger, he will, and he'll, he'll replace him. Um, Won't have to. Or he's going to – either that or just Stidham really sucks. I don't know. Well, what, what happens Stidham now with the big rumors going out there? Oh, Julio? Julio? Jones. Well, if they get Julio, I mean, that's going to help. But it doesn't it's matter how help. great your receivers oh, are crazy. if your quarterback can't throw the football to him. And I know you're like a huge Cam. You were Not on him last Cam year. Huge Cam only lost a few games last year with fumbles. But anyway. He's COVID. 
I, it's not COVID. COVID, Bob. COVID like, all oh, right. So this is my thing. And, and no weapons. This, okay. So there was limited weapons. But but how all of a but, sudden, if you look at his numbers, right? When did he start falling down? It was after he got COVID and after Edelman was out. He's also got four new weapons that are. He's got pretty okay, good. two tight ends, two wide receivers. This is good. so you're. The best they got. They got you're, the, you're a professional the, football player. So I don't know what I'm talking. about. They have. So what? <laughs> what? When I used to, I'm not a hater. I'm not a hater at all. I love when people succeed. I love when people do well. I so have if an Cam issue. comes out and lights it up, you'll be. You'll I'll be say, say that he's doing. Again. I'll say that Cam okay. Newton has has. I want to see that. I want to see that. Listen. If on Cam first Newton, take, if Cam Newton if he goes comes out, and beats out, Brady week four. If he comes I want out, you to wear Brady, a Cam Newton jersey I will, on first take. I will. I will wear. I will wear. I will, wear I will wear a Cam Newton jersey if week four Cam Newton outperforms Tom Brady. But I would say this: after playing football for eleven years, after witnessing quarterbacks and playing against Cam Newton and listening to Bill tell us to keep him in the pocket and he'll throw us a ball, that when you play quarterbacks like. Tom Brady, Drew Brees, uh, you know Peyton Manning, like all those like elite quarterbacks that understand, just don't show, don't, do not show them the coverages, do not move as a safety, don't show them cover two, cover three, don't show them man, let's all play, like don't show them the blitzer, he's gonna kill us. Mac Jones to me is a guy that you could come in and you could throw a phone book at him and yeah. you could say, listen, this is what we want to run. These are all our checks. If they're in this, run that. If they're in that, run this. And last year, when they blitz Cam, he couldn't check the plays. He didn't know what to do. He didn't know. And that's not because, like, when you're talking like week 12, week 14, like, you should know when there's a safety rolling down that, hey, I shouldn't run this play. It's not going to work. And, and I pay a quarterback. Every team should pay their quarterback to put their team – in the best play possible versus what the defense shows them, and as a defender. But what he gives you in other areas, though, with that he can't run threat, anymore. Yes, he can. You know, he can't. Well, he's he's like eleven rushing touchdowns. Touch. Yeah, yeah, but that was like within the ten yard. But that's what you need. I'm though. talking. No, yeah. you want a guy. Very short fourth and short though, he's money. Yeah. Except for and Seattle, he also had no weapons. Yeah, but Seattle. And Buffalo, Seattle, he should have checked out the play. Buffalo, he, yeah, he didn't check out of it. He, he would have won the Buffalo game if he didn't fumble up. Yeah, game, yeah, I'll give you all if, that. If but it was a fifth, if this was a, if it was a fifth, we'd all be he, drunk. He had no one to play. He's drinking that twelve percent alcohol oh, per volume. That twelve one. <laughs> Who's he, he throwing to last year? So he wasn't throwing to anybody. Kobe Myers. But the there was Keel also Harris. guys I mean, that were. I think Myers actually. I like good, Myers. Yeah, was like, no, I don't Myers think Bird was good. Fourth best guy at a great team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not a weak guy. Bird wasn't good. I mean, the tight ends. I mean, yeah. they had one, the, you, one, you could have taken the third string tight end from any t- other team, and they would have been the number one tight this end is, on the team. This is what I like about Mac Jones. In 2021, if you are a college kid that has that's on a big t- big D1 school on a ride, a full ride, and you are a sophomore or a freshman or a redshirt fro- yeah. red, – say a redshirt sophomore. Yeah, he should And left. you see there's three guys in front of you that are yeah. all first-round talents – and you're not going to get a shot to play until you're a fifth-year senior. Yeah. And you stick it out to me. He wants to. He has the mentality of a guy that competes. That's not afraid to compete. Most people these days are like, I want to. I want to go play. I yeah. want to transfer. Yeah. I want to go. And you see all these quarterbacks. They go from school to school to school, and they go to a place where they know they can play. Mac Jones stayed at Alabama. Yep. Waited for his time. Tua got hurt, Listen, came in. You can like Cam and like yeah, Mac Jones. Well, that's what I mean. Like Mac Doesn't Jones, it's not either or to me. Mac, Mac Jones, Jones is, the, is the franchise. But I, I honestly believe that Cam, if he has a decent year, better than decent year, can be a viable option for a couple of years until Mac is ready. But, but you I don't, don't mind if Mac accelerates that program. I don't mind if Mac becomes a starter yeah. in week four. I just don't think we're totally fucked because Cam's a quarterback. Yeah. So my thing is, that you don't pay, you don't draft a fifteenth overall quarterback. To pay Cam, if Pam, if Cam has a great year, you pay him seven Pam, bucks. Pam, 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 Pam. If Cam has a great he has a year, low cap number. He's not going to take it's a ten million dollar incentive dollars. based contract. And but well, Max is a fifteen pick, but he's also the fifth quarterback chosen. Yeah. It wasn't a one or two or three or four. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So he's not going to be paid at the high end of that market. He was the, he was the leftovers on the plate. Honestly, he should have been the third pick. Him. But sure. I, I, I think he was the he was the second or third best quarterback in the draft. But. I think, I think week one, week one, 2022, he's the starter. People week get one, caught up, especially coaches, because most of the coaches and scouting department people, they've never played a down of football. They 
you know, learn football through flipping through pages and yeah. watching film and they fall in love. It's like, Jimmy, I love you. But when I was at Purdue, I had my, my dorm room, the guy next to me, Jimmy, good friend, my, my godparent to one of my ch children. Um, Garoppolo? No, not, you know, Wozniak. But anyway, Close. he's like, he's got his master's in math. He does algorithms for invest investors. He like figures out where you invest your money and like, blah, 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 blah. but he's a big nerd. He loves, he loved like hanging out with the athletes. He loved hanging out with the football players. A lot of these coaches, they fall in love with what the look of the guy looks like. Yeah. Oh, this guy's 6'3", big, strong, fast, runs a 40, 4'4". Four, four. But at the end of the day, the guy doesn't play well. So, you know, for me, it's not falling in love with like measurables and what a guy looks like. Because when Cam walks on a field, you're, I, I, look, I, firsthand, I'll tell you, when I saw Cam walk onto a field, we were playing, we were playing them in Carolina. He walked on, I said, be able to tackle that guy <laughs> that guy's huge what are you talking about he walks on you know he strolls on you know he's walking on but then he says a prayer like please don't throw an interception and don't suck today oh, stop it. then he goes then he goes out there <laughs> please win another <laughs> mvp yeah. please go 15 and one again oh Come please on. if there's a fumble in the super bowl i will not just stop and let the other team get it like the oh yeah like ah because yeah. listen to this i want to tell you this too i've i've seen a ball right there on a field i look at it there's 10 other guys yeah, that are all looking for that ball. When everyone's going for that thing and you're going after it like you're trying to, it's like the most desperate thing yeah. that you ever could want and you're trying to get it, that's intense. Because you, as you're you coming in. You have Bill on your shoulder. Yeah. Hiss, the ball's <laughs> on the ground, first of all. Get, oh, get and, Jesus oh, you know, Christ! You know, yeah, that I gotta get the gets ball. that ball first is gonna get some sort of credit Something. in the locker room, right? So listen, I was at the bottom of the pile, and I had a ball like this, and I had dudes like wrenching on my like side fat, <laughs> trying to grab my nuts, like ripping at my fingers, and I'm just sitting there like, get off of me, get off of me. There was like 30 people on I top of me. I know go. there's only you know 11 on uh, 11 on each side, but anyway, there was so much weight on me i couldn't even breathe and i was tired at the time it's a scary situation yeah but it doesn't it doesn't give him a pass in the super bowl no, because no. it's a super bowl it was, that I'll ball's give, on the ground terrible. you got to go get that ball i don't like to knock against mac saying he had so much talent yeah. around him right so that's his that's his, that's fault. his fault yeah he's still got to make that throw that's like oh, saying right. pat mahomes, pat mahomes yeah. has got tyree kill yeah. and kelsey, kelsey. Well, and, that's and the thing is, or you could say okay i'll tell around him then why did waddle Go like seventh. Why right. did Devonta Smith go fifth? Yes. Or fourth? Yes. You can also Why? see what happens when you don't have a line. Yeah. So he had a good line. He wasn't. Yeah, he yeah. wasn't pressured yeah. up. And then he was Look at Patrick chill. Mahomes in the, in the Super yeah. Bowl last year, was running for terrible. his life. Right. What did Kansas City do? Sign the two best offensive linemen available as free agents for monster contracts. It's like, oh, you look at the Patriots, they have the best offensive line in football now. Sure. That's, no, that's why I think Cam will succeed. Well, Ted Karras is a backup. It's pretty good. It's yeah, good yeah. yeah. but that's why Cam will succeed because he has the best offensive line, the best running back group, the best tight end group, an improved wide receiver group. And then the yeah, other thing yeah. that's very improved, the defense is now going to come back as a top tier defense in the NFL. Defense is stacked. Yeah. I mean, and you just have to hope that. I think of Jones, though. Their offense goes from like a B plus to pretty oh, it's, serious. It's, it's, yeah. it's an A. It's an A if they get if they get Julio. So so are they, are they Super Bowl contenders if they get Julio? I see that, that's just, that's, a, that's like a question. That, that's that's a, here. That's, that's a, a fan. Question. That's a fan no, 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 question. That's an ESPN question because you know you'll get asked that if you're no, on first day Super Bowl and they trade for Julio Jones. They, the first thing you you're, the question you're gonna get from your producer is, and I'm gonna say I'm gonna Super say you're a Super Bowl contender if you take all that talent collectively and okay. perform but because you can have a talented Bill roster. It's Bill Belichick. Think about 2007. That 2007 roster was the most talented roster you could ever imagine yeah. and they lost the Super they Bowl. They lost one game though. They, they lost. Yeah, you can always lose a game. Sure. I'm saying are they contenders they that game to go to the Super Bowl? hundred times, they would have yeah. won 81, I mean. 81 times. Yeah, but I'm just asking are they contenders? I feel like I should fill this up. I'm going to fill this up. Yeah. It's the pink candle right there. Right, I'm going to go straight. Can you see yeah. me? I think it's not going to see me. I'll be right back. I'm going to fill this up. I'll be right back. He, he's the biggest cam hater in the world. That's what we deal. I deal with every single week. <laughs> Don't mess it up. It's all about the poor.
All right, so that's a four. Sign me up. That's actually a good four. You know how much beer? Rob Nigovich, guest bartender, every Saturday, 12 to 2. He would actually do that. Let's actually. talk about that later because <laughs> I would love to do that. Celebrity bartender. I would love to do that. I would. Be, he would, he would there's no that. mixed drinks, so I couldn't mess it up. Like, uh, this isn't a gin and tonic. I'd say, shut up. Yeah. It's a beer. <laughs> Just this. drink it. I want a gin and tonic. Here you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beer. <laughs> Have a boom sauce. Yeah. Have there's a boom sauce. funny Heineken commercial where a gentleman goes up to the bar and makes with this elaborate martini request. Yeah. <laughs> and the bartender looks at him dead face, reaches down, just hands it behind again. Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. Here's a beer. Here's a beer. What's up? Off the Patriots and back to beer. Oh, I you you had some big news. Uh, I think it's huge news, especially growing up growing up in New England. You know, we're we're two people from New England. You imported here, and then yeah, yeah kinda, I'm kind of like bar, but similar then similar a bit. suburb. Of Chicago. But you guys had some big news with the Red Sox at Fenway. Yeah, uh, we sell a beer we make called Six One Seven, right? So we trademarked Six One Seven a couple years back. And we all understand the story around the marathon bombings and the, with Boston Strong and the galvanization of the city, and how the sports teams played into that. Um, and it played an important role of sort of healing and moving on and just processing pain. Um, and so we saw a lot of Bruins and Red Sox, Celtics, Patriots, jerseys showing 617. And so uh, I thought it would make sense for us to make a beer called 617. Uh, for Boston, right? Boston's the area. 617 is obviously the area code of Boston, always has been. Um, and it's just, it's a beer for Boston. And so when we built it, designed it, trademarked it, we approached uh, Fenway and we had a hard time getting boom sauce in the Fenway because of its ABV and, and price point. Um, but 617 they loved and uh, loved the idea about it, the concept behind it. It's 6.1% alcohol. It's got the uh, blue, red, uh, you know, Red Sox colors. Yeah, it looks just like it. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, so we sold it there in 19. It was a really special day for me, opening day, April 6th, I believe. We rented uh, John Henry's box that day. And That's I cool. invited uh, my father and uncles and cousins and uh, a bunch of uh, coworkers and some of our best clients, customers. And uh, it was an amazing day, just growing up, you know, growing up in the projects, going my, you know, my grandparents didn't have any dough. I'd go to maybe one game a year. I was big into Yaz. My grandfather's a really diehard Red Sox fan. And he was really uh, cheap, too, so he wouldn't spend any money at the game. I'd get, like, one ice cream bar, and he would get one beer. But it meant the world to me to go in there with my grandfather. So uh, all those years later, to sell my beer at Fenway, to have it surrounded by my friends and family, and then seeing people walking around with the hawker boxes, say, 617, it's this really special thing, and so I went to the game last night. And I was in, um, at sitting on top of the monster, and people around me were drinking six one seven, and uh, it was I got some great photos, and it's just still it never gets old. The fact that people are still drinking six one seven at Fenway, and two years ago, not at nineteen, we were the number two selling beer in the whole park behind Bud Light. That's and that's pretty. That's awesome. and we don't we don't do any yet not yet we don't do any marketing spend there so just to come out of nowhere. We launched 617 at Fenway. So Fenway was the exclusive place for 617 for the first two months before we started selling it in bars and restaurants and package stores. Uh, and then obviously we lost last year because there was no fans in Fenway. And so now we're back. And uh, yeah. we went from 12% to 25%. This Saturday is almost fully open. That's yeah, awesome. 100%. So we're ramping up production and ideally 617 will be all over the park uh, this weekend. Is it cans or, or cans draft? primarily. Okay. So you want to come to the we were gonna go to the monster. We we're gonna do a little like, you know, on the monster, yeah. drinking, having fun, like throwing peanuts at each other. Yeah, I want to see Rob like get, get a ball and throw it back at the players and all that. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll hit, hit home plate. Out. I'll hit home plate from the no, monster. Hey, don't don't freaking test my arm now. It's better than Cam Newton's. We, we gotta <laughs> test this. We gotta test this. <laughs> so this was last night. Just, <laughs> oh, yeah. nice! I love yeah, that. Awesome. That's the best. List. Listen, that is if you get. To you, you know, enjoy. Four pack, please, for six if you can enjoy a game at Fenway, I've been on those seats right there. They're awesome. They're 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 like the best seats when you're on the monster. The only thing that like sketches me out is like I'm a little bit like the height guy. You so know, I the second no. row. So no. I was in the top second. row. This yeah, yeah. The top yeah. Row. yeah. So if you're on the it first row, because awesome there's a fence behind you, there's yeah. a walkway and a fence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super yeah. Safe. It's also the highest point in the park, so you get to see the whole view and the yeah. wind is ripping through. Yeah, it's cool. I I had a great time. I was sitting on a 
a foldable seat. That was my, you know, my butt started hurt after a while. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the thing. Is growing up as a kid, like you know, it was the net there. The net was there. That's where the balls yeah. went yeah, into. Yeah, yeah. You know, they, they, they change cool. it to that. Let me, let me just see. open it up. Yeah, yeah, it's a hazy it. IPA. For you. It's a hazy. See have the, you had six one seven? I have not. I have not. I'm not. Let's see. Let's see what this one looks like. So this, so that's actually that's a blue. That's really cool. It's just yeah. Six it's one like perfect seven. For the Red Sox. And okay, so when you guys were doing the the alcohol content. Six point one seven percent. It's hard to dial. How did you dial that in? How did you? It's hard to dial that in. Because it's, really like it's not like eight, eight, four, five. In full transparency. <laughs> is it a little bit different? The TTB allows us to be within point three. Okay. Oh, okay. So we we have had batches that have hit exactly six point one seven, but sometimes they're every batch is slightly potentially different uh, by minuscule amounts. So it's close enough. It's close enough. That's yeah. that's really cool because when I saw that, I'm like. How do you pinpoint? That's like if I was doing a, a breathalyzer. I'm like, I'm gonna make this one. Yeah, 0.08. 0.08 or 0.079. 0.079. <laughs> 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 Can't do it. That's really cool. Let me just. Why not? When, when in Lord Hobo, can you? Smell good. Get the hell out of here. That is good. Yeah, that is really good. Seeing people that is all around stuff. us drinking six one seven at Fenway, it just it's a thrill every time. So when they're when you're in Fenway, they have the guys going around, you know. Bears yep, bears yep, get your bed. Like do they have to pop it and put it in a plastic cup? No, they give you the can. They give you the can. They do always open it though, because they don't want yeah. it to be a projectile later. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, a full beer can would be pretty pretty dangerous. So they always open them. But so so far this year they haven't had the hawker boxes because of COVID. But as of this week, I think they will. So oh, they have the guys come uh, around. Yeah, and so we started out in nineteen with one box, one person with one box of six one seven. Oh, and in the whole park. In the whole park. Mm-hmm. And then by year's end, there was a half dozen. Okay. And I would see it. I would because I was going to a lot of games because I wanted to see how it was going. And so you would see the person carrying the box going down in one section and then being gone out of it. And they had to go or back, go and, get more. and then they come out, and they'd start again, and they'd be gone in the next section. And so eventually, they just added more and more boxes. That, you know, that's something I didn't even think about. Like, you remember being at a ball game, and you're in the middle of the section, yeah. and you got the guy come down, hot dogs, peanuts, whatever, yeah, here's the and you go boom, and then people pop, 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 and then pop, 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 back. Is that is that back? I don't know if it's back yet. Weekend. Right now, it's not this because weekend. you have to order the stuff on your phone, and you go pick it up. That's what it is right now. Oh, really? Yeah. In the stadium right now, you, have, you yeah. can't go. Yeah, you can walk up and get it yourself. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, or you, but the, you the order hockey boxes should be it. back Because I want to bring my son to a baseball game, and I want him to experience. Like I, used, I grew really up is. in Chicago. I used to go. My dad used to take me to Comiskey Park. I'd go to the games. Similar to, like, you and your, your grandfather. Like, my old man wasn't, like, I'd go to one game every five years, maybe. So it was like a, like a treat yeah, for a me to go to a game. And... It wasn't like, hey, whatever you want, you got. It'd be like, what do you want? What do you want? I'd be yeah. like, peanuts? Peanuts, let's go. You know, yeah. Captain Insano, I know you're watching. Just take it easy. We only went to a few games because you were working seven days a week, but it's all good. Thanks for that one. <laughs> He'd be like, oh, what? what are you talking about? He'll call me. He'll no, be like, for, for kids going to, going to a Red Sox game, I think they all understand what it is. Like my daughter... You know, she's been to a couple of Red Sox games, and then when she turned 10, that's when they were in the World Series against the Dodgers. She's like, all I want for my birthday is to go to the game. That's all she wanted. I mean, it's pretty I mean, special. When yeah. I used to go, so in Comiskey Park, you could come out of the, it's not Comiskey Park. I don't know what it's called anymore. That was the old one, and they built the new one, and it, it, yeah. it was terrible because they rebuilt it in, like, the projects, but there was, like, a fenced-in area where they had all the, the players come out and We'd all stand, I, as a kid, I'd stand there 10 years old, I'd have a baseball in my hand, I'd ask all these players, like, hey, can I get an autograph, can I get an autograph? And you'd have some guys that just ignore you, and then you'd have certain guys, like Bo Jackson, which was the best. Bo knows. The best experience of my life, so I think it was like in the ni- it was like 95, I want to say 95, Bo, Bo Jackson was playing for the Sox. I'm standing out by the fence, he was coming out to a white, Porsche. She had like a white 911, which is, it's crazy that you remember these things as a kid. 
And I'm standing there and I'm yelling, yelling. There's a bunch of people there. And he said, hey, throw me the ball. So I threw him the ball, signed it, threw it back to me. And like, as a professional athlete, when I was playing, that's kind of the, I guess when you're a kid and you see a kid and he's asking for an autograph, I would never turn down a kid, like no matter what. An adult though? An adult. Like get away from me. Kick rocks. <laughs> kick some rocks. You got some adult that'll come up to you with a napkin and a ballpoint pen. You're like, look, dude, you're 40 years old. Like, what do you want me to do with this ballpoint pen and your napkin or like a phone ball? You just ball? take it like throw it at him? Like, no, I just say like, hey, look, I, I, that's not like a real thing. Like that's a, that's a napkin and a pen. It won't sign. Like you also know that there's some things that work and things that don't. Like a ballpoint pen and a baseball, that works. Is there something that, so you grew up not a professional athlete, you grew up a kid yeah. admiring other professional yes. athletes, yes. and you became a professional athlete that other kids looked up to, yes. like Super Bowl champion multiple times. Is there something that sticks out that really surprised you about the, di the difference between your expectation of super athletes as a kid and what the reality was like? I think uh, just the, that those guys were like superheroes. It's like, like when you're a kid and you think of like Spider-Man and like Superman and Batman, like those guys are like beyond human, right? They're like beyond like what you could imagine. And then when I started to play football and I started to become like, you know, working hard and getting better at it, like you realize that those guys are just normal. They're normal guys. They just are really talented at what they love and like what they have had a talent at at a young age and then they worked and worked and worked and then they got to a certain level. So when I was able to be a professional athlete and I would see a kid that was like, you know, a perfect example would be like 2009 when I got to the Patriots, they still had Randy Moss and they still had Junior Seau. And those guys to me were similar in a sense of when I saw Junior Seau and he was like right next to me, I'm like, same feeling. I'm like, <laughs> I'd be like looking at him, like, oh no. So how was it with John Lynch? What do I say? Well, John Lynch. I mean, so when Lynch came in in 2009, he was older. And when I say superheroes, you think of a, a player and you think of, you know, John Lynch as like Tampa, and like the defender and like killing people and like, and then you start to see like an older guy like trying to hang on and trying to play and then you're a young guy and you're like that it's really hard to see a guy that when you're young and you watch somebody as you're growing up be an older player and not be what you imagine them to be because they're old and they still don't have they don't have the skills anymore so that was that was hard to watch a guy like that and i mean even junior like i i, I credit junior to helping my career, it was New Year's Day. I think, I, I don't know if I've said this story. Yeah. If I say this story, it was New Year's Day. Yeah. Junior Seau was sitting there in his locker. He had a bunch of drinks the night before, obviously, in New Year's Eve. Sitting there, he looks at me, he goes, you think too much. I'm like, what are, you, what are you talking about, Junior? And he's like, you think too much. When you miss a play, you overanalyze it and it messes you up. Like, you just gotta move on from it. Don't, don't, let, don't let one play affect like the rest of your game. And like from that point on, Junior retired. I mean, Junior retired. Obviously, we know Junior's not with us anymore. But like just that little nugget, you're like sitting there, and you're like, "Wow, that's like a Hall of Fame football player telling me, stop overanalyzing and just play it. and just like go have fun." Because at the end of the day, when we're kids and we're throwing that baseball to Bo Jackson or being super fans of whoever, like we're just fans, and fans turn into pro athletes. So I think that that's also too, like some guys lose touch of what that was. And you might have a, an athlete, because let's be honest, like an athlete has a, a short window to do something for a short amount of time. And after I've retired and been away from the game, like there's plenty of people that are more successful, make more money. So don't let that like athlete status like affect your ego because there was guys when I'd say, hey, can I get your autograph? They just straight ignored me, like didn't even look at me. You know, and it's it's kind of a shame because at the end of the day, like if one guy just would talk to that kid and give him an autograph, it would just change his whole life. And it's weird to think back in, I think I want to say like the Green Bay Packers 
when I was 10 years old, around the same time, used to do training camp in Arizona, and my grandparents had a like a little like mobile home that was like in an old people like park in Phoenix, Arizona. And I went out to their training camp in Arizona, and I, w- I wanted to see Brett Favre, and I wanted to see the Packers, and like I was a huge just football fan, like a huge fan. And I was like a fat kid, and I, w- I never played because I was like a chubby kid, and I was too heavy to play. Yeah, I, was, I was hefty. I was a hefty. I was a husky, bugle boy husky. So that's what my mom would say. You're a husky. Yeah, go to Sears. Yeah. It's like the husky department. <laughs> husky department. <laughs> yeah. I was a husky kid, so... Um, Truffle shuffle. My mom would say, you're not fat, you're just thick. I'm like, thanks, mom. You're big bone. <laughs> you're big bone. Yeah, I'm like, I'm not, yeah, thanks, I'm mom. Like, I'm fat, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, no, the kids call me fat, mom. But anyway, um, so they had uh, John Yurkovich, who was a guard for the Green Bay Packers, and now he works for Yurko. He works for the ESPN in Chicago. He does, like, the radio stuff. And there was training camp. I'm He's Croatian, so his last name is Jurkovic. I'm Nikovic. I say, Kako si, which is how are you? And he said, Dobro, which is good. And I have a picture of me and him. I was like, I had like a T Rex t shirt on. Like, it's, it's, I could probably pull it up for you. Um, so I, it's just so weird because years later, it was one after, I think, after 20. 14, I'm doing an interview with like ESPN Chicago and it's Yurko. I'm like, hey, do you know we took a picture together? And he, was, and he had no idea. Of course, yeah. of course he but um, one, of, one of thousands of pictures. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to pull it up. Couldn't believe you were an athlete. While you're pulling up, I think it's time to take a break. Okay, let's come do back. It. Uh, so we'll uh, take a break here and we'll be back in a few minutes. I got a pretty uh, big question to ask. Uh oh. Uh oh, big questions. So we're back here, and I think everybody watching wants to hear, you know, the question I think that needs to be asked here of uh, Mr. Lanigan here of Lord Hobo. What is your favorite beer? Ooh, oh, that's a tough yeah, one. Favorite, favorite beer that uh, we make or the favorite beer? No, that you, that, okay. let's go, we'll do two. Okay. That you make and then your favorite so beer of all So for time. a long time, you know, I owned a beer bar in Western Mass starting in 02, so it's 19 years which is crazy, and on the menu there for for years, I had a beer, and I wrote next to it in the descriptions. Back then, we had these big poster board menus written with all the details about the beers, and I said, world's best beer, and I left it that way for years, and I, I would argue that it's still, I still maintain that. It's a brewery in Belgium called Duranka, mm-hmm. and the beer's called XX Bitter, and uh, I've been to that brewery many times, uh, friendly with the the uh, owners, brewers, and uh, it's just, uh, it's my favorite beer of all time. But for here, it's, uh, we make a beer called Museum, and it's triple IPA, 11%, Ooh. and I named it Museum because in, in our culture, obviously, in most cultures, Museum is where you put all your best stuff, right? The stuff you want to last for the ethos. So. Um, Museum, to me, is our best beer. We only make it a couple times a year. It's really challenging to make. It takes a long time. It's really fickle um, because it's so boozy. But there's no heat to it. There's, you don't get any alcohol. Uh, you just get all juice. And uh, When is that? When's the next batch? Uh, not soon enough. Because I, <laughs> I, might, I might be sleeping outside. So, I, so the, it's, it's pretty rough. So uh, two 16-ounce cans is the equivalent of alcohol or a bottle of red wine. Ooh. And if you have a four wow. pack, you just double it. Page, oh. let's split it. <laughs> wink, so, wink. Huh? So four pack, which is what I typically consume, unfortunately, is two bottles of wine. Ooh. To me, it's oh. the world's <laughs> most emotional beer because I usually end up crying if I have four of them. <laughs> and it's, sometimes it's positive, sometimes yeah, it's, it's negative. Be like, oh, this sucks. Depends, <laughs> depends on my, who, the, who I'm yeah, drinking yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we make oh. a beer called uh, Virtuosa, which I also love. Uh, and that's a, a seasonal beer as well. Uh, and the beer I drink the most of is Boom Sauce. Uh, Boom. I think I've, I'm probably comfortable saying I probably have consumed the most Boom Sauce of any human alive. And uh, you know, it it takes its toll on your on your waistline over over the years. Uh, Boom it's Sauce okay. is seven point eight. Let's start training, brother. Me and you. Let's go, baby. Yeah. And uh, you get pay Robin Boom Sauces. <laughs> 
I will. I listen. Like, if there was any like type of currency that you could pay me in, beer is perfectly yeah, so like perfectly just brought like screw the crypto. Give me beer. Like, I don't give a shit. No about NFTs. Crypto. I don't need an NFT. <laughs> give me some uh, boom sauce. Give me some six one seven. Give me a juice lord. Give me cases. Give me a, a little small keg. Be a kegerator in my house because the key to me about like being healthy, you just gotta burn more than you put in, right? So for me, it's like, all right, how many of these am I gonna have? I don't care. I'll go run. The other day when you came in though to the show, you were. Uh, I was sore. Yeah. Couldn't get up. Yeah. Because yeah, I put fun. myself through the ringer, but it's okay. When well, you, when we met first last week, uh, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. I was so psyched because you said you had gone on vacation. Yeah. To one of the islands, and you brought a case of boom sauce with you. Yeah. And I've done the same. I think I was in St. Kitts, and you were in Nevis. Nevis. Or I was in Nevis. You were in St. Kitts. I forget. Nevis. Revis. Revis. I, Revis? I, I brought a, a case of boom sauce to Nevis, and I have pictures from the pool at that resort. I'm pretty sure you have the same pictures. So I was psyched because we didn't know each other, and you unprovoked. You said, "I brought boom sauce on vacation, which I love." Boom sauce is really good, but you you turned me on to the boom sauce galaxy. Which is, I mean, it's a it's different than the uh, the boom sauce, but it's the galaxy is the yeah. hop that is yeah. the sort of unbelievable, the coolest, sexiest hop these days. It has been for a couple of years, um, and it gives you all that juice character, that great aromatics. And so we double dry or really triple dry hop boom sauce with galaxy to make galaxy boom sauce, and we'll do that with some of our core beers. We'll add different hop profiles. Uh, and the dry hopping to create different aromatics and flavors. So uh, Galaxy Boom Sauce is one of our tap room releases. It's, it goes out to, into the world for a month or two, a year, uh, and then it disappears. So it's kind of fun because you got to get it while you can. I just had an epiphany of, of, of merging two things together, which would be amazing. I'm not talking about dealerships and drinking. I'm not talking about that. I'm yeah, talking, you can't, can't, can't do that. I'm talking yeah. the Dan and Nico show maybe creating themselves a little studio in the Dan O'Brien auto world where we were going to do a little spot yeah. with a little tap room of maybe some boom sauce, maybe some juice Lord and Lord Hobo. And we could have Dan on the show because he does love cars as well. Yeah. I, I think that would be a great marriage. So you're going to sleep there? <laughs> Depends on if Paige is mad at me. Or not, you know. If Paige gives me some shit about the Impala, that's what, that's what Uber's for. You know? <laughs> we'll put some museum on tap. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I, I hope one day to open up a small bar and only have one tap and have it be museum. Oh, really? Uh, it's, that uh, would it's, be amazing. Two glass limit per, per customer kind of thing. <laughs> so, yeah. growing up, I'm going to put uh, Captain Insano on the spot. Like back in the day when I was about 10, 11, 12, I used to get off of school, I come home. I jump on my bike. I go to Harry's bar. My old man would be down there. I'd get a, I'd get a Coca Cola. I'd get a Okie Doke popcorn, and I'd play the poker machine. And anything I won, he would just pay it back to the bar. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if that's legal anymore. But uh, I was about ten. But I always ask my old man, say, Dad, like, what do you want to do? He's like, I want to open a little, little pub, little Ninko pub, just. Small little spot, locals, couple beers, nothing crazy. I mean, that sounds like to just have one tap and just have people there to like mingle and have fun yeah. and sit you down. Can't, you can't come decide what you want. It's just, you just whatever you want. Like, like it's you there. can't. It's just that. Yeah, so yeah. You know, just that, that famous bar in New York called McSorley's. I, I think it closed actually, tragically. But they had two beers, light or dark. Yeah, that's it, light or dark. Yeah. And there was no seat, you had no, no, you had no choice. You had stand, and it was like a wonderful bar it was around for a million years. Um, two, two, two options, and so I think owning a small. I got my first bar in Amherst. It was 12 bar stools, 40 seats total. And I could run the whole thing myself. It was it wasn't too busy. I could pour. I could run the car, take the cash, sweep, you know, clean the bathrooms. I'll do it myself. So that was fun. It was neighborhoody, but even a little bit smaller than that. Maybe a place that holds like 20, 25 people. One tap. Yeah. And, just just become, and you only open like four nights a week from yeah. four to ten. That's it. Something yeah. like that. And the rest of the time, you don't you don't care. But just a place for your friends to come and hang out. Game is on. Um, That'd be a cool, cool spot. Yeah, passion project. Probably building your backyard. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you live? I'll be there. In Seaport, yeah. See, yeah. Well, not maybe not there. It's thousand dollars square foot. So <laughs> well, we're right. I'm building, yeah, maybe more than that now. Yeah. I'm currently building a huge place in the Seaport. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, yeah, definitely talk about that. The patio. Where, yeah, yeah, where's that going to be at in the Seaport? It's a couple hundred yards from Harpoon. 
Okay, so, so Harpoon, down, I know where Harpoon's at. Right, yep. And then there's a new building there. We have the first so floor. So past, past the, uh, where's the little, like, uh, venue that they have the concerts and stuff? Yeah, the pavilion. It changes names every three minutes. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. It's a different bank every three minutes. Yeah, past the pavilion. So past the New pavilion. building. We have a 9,000 square foot patio. It's seats, Sick. Yeah. It seats 500 outside. So yeah, one that's of the awesome. largest patios yeah. in the city. That'll be open this summer, hopefully in a couple of weeks. Sweet. Well, I'll and, be uh, there. Yeah, opening. Where I will be there. I'll bring Pass the setup. Up. I'll bring your setup. How about that? No, I'll drive. No, there. no possible. Why not? I got good insurance. Bring your Corvette. I might not have it. You have two. I have an old one. I'll Same bring the old one. I'll bring the old one. You have old two old ones. ones. No, I sold the one. Oh, sorry, you sold the. I old sold two. the black one. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, I forgot about that. Mm. Another thing I want to talk about too is you sent me a, a link to it, and I thought it was pretty cool. Is you speaking at Google? I thought that was pretty cool. cool. Yeah, that was uh, that a lifetime cool. achievement experience. Yeah. You know, uh, Google had reached out. They were doing a speaking series, talks at Google, and uh, I went down to the campus and you know on a Friday afternoon and we served beers and I just chatted about uh, my experience and as a you know beer businessman and uh, some of our core philosophies as a company and how to grow and how to um, you know, the sort of philosophy behind growth and how to build a team and organization and uh, how to take care of staff and build a place people want to be part of so it was it was an awesome experience and it will live forever on the internet you know it's um, it looks good in a resume although I have never I've made a resume <laughs> you don't need one. 20 something <laughs> yeah. years so, so, yeah. uh, that's it's so my first day when I went to Purdue so I went to Purdue, Purdue University played for Purdue yada 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 but my first day at Purdue I had a math course right Go to this math class. I sit down, like, okay, get my pen and paper out, I'm start taking notes. There's this guy walks in, I can't understand him. He was talking a mile a minute. I look around, I'm taking every note. I'm like, God. I look around, all these kids are sleeping. I go, hey, you got this? He goes, I did that in high school. I was like, I called my mom, I get out. I said, mom, I don't know if I fit in here. I don't know. I uh, I don't know if I'm smart enough for Purdue University because math class is ridiculous, and everyone around me is talking about like crazy equations and you know what they're gonna do after school. They're gonna go study together. Like I don't know. So I'm sure Google, like you walked into Google, you had been a little bit like these are like the the brilliant or the brilliant, and but then you walk in, you're like, this is what I did, and this is how I did it. Yeah, for sure. The elite minds of our generation, ultimately. Yeah. Some of them work there, and some of them work at Facebook. You know, but there's only so many of those folks. So. Yeah. Yeah, it was amazing to, to speak there and to have them so wrapped up in what I was saying. Because, you know, let's face it, like making beer is cool, right? It's Selling very beer cool. is cool. And, yep. Um, and building a, a a business. Passion. Behind beer, it's like, yep. I think for the first ten years of my career, I was really focused on craft beer passionately. And, over the last 10 years, it's evolved into craft beer passion with also business passion. Like, I want to be good at this. I want yep. to be good at, um, I want to be a good CEO and I, I want to uh, be a sort of ultimate leader in the industry and so, build a good company that people are proud to work for. So, did you, um, did you go to a business school or you just learn no, I, from I, being I dropped, on the job? I went to and, college and I realized it wasn't for me. And I went to Northeastern for a year. I dropped out at, at the end of the first year. And started traveling and working and traveling and working and um, went to UMass for a semester and then realized like, I kind of took another shot at it and it, UMass had given me a full scholarship so I, I said is that still valid three years later and they said sure and I tried that again it just didn't work for me so um, the only thing I, I, I was living in Mexico and I was 25 and I was kind of broke and I was worried that I'd be uh, stuck being a you know, a service industry employee until I was 75 because there's no pension, there's no 401k at the time. I had no skills. I had no, no degree. So I, the only thing I knew how to do was to run restaurant bars and I borrowed uh, 60 grand from like 30 different people. And I bought a dive bar at, at UMass that it was 60, exactly $60,000. And I, you know, did a wood finishing and refit in my, in my friend's basement and put a sound system in and a TV and opened up. And it was very, very busy. and. It was a big relief, but I love that. Uh, yeah. I love. I freaking love that. I love that. I love the first that. day we opened. Uh, I was packed, and I, I was so exhausted. And we spent six months waiting for the liquor license transfer, and I was 
my, my roommate who owned a burrito shop in Amherst, the famous one, was giving me burrito coupons. This is what I was living off of. I was out of money. Everything I had was in the brewery. I'm uh, sorry, in the bar. And the day we opened up, we got totally full all day long. I went outside. It's in, it's in a strip mall next to a gas station. I went out and sat down on one of the pump curbs and just cried. That's I was awesome. like so emotional. Yeah, that's awesome. I was like, I can pay rent this week. I can survive this week. People don't hate this place. Like, that's awesome. It was an amazing experience. Uh, and every day it was busy. The first few months, it was like 100 days in a row, full. And I was out of a breathing room, and people liked me, and they would spend money here. And I, could, and I started hiring staff, and everyone was like having a blast. It was like a big living room. People that didn't know they knew each other that suddenly became friends. That's it cool. It became like a real community center. And uh, there's a lot of, I mean, I, I'm 19 years later, it's still there. I sold it to my college roommate, and he still owns it. It hasn't changed. I mean, nothing. That's cool. Not a drop of paint spent in there. It's awesome. It's authentic. But I have people who met there who have children who are now almost old enough to go there themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, that first well, let's not date ourselves Every once here. In a while, yeah, yeah. someone on Facebook will hit me up and say, I yeah. just want you to know I met my husband or I met my wife at your place in 2004. And we now have a 16-year-old. And we, they, you know, we just drove by the bar. And we were like, we met there. Yeah. We just want to... Thank you for opening that place. You know, That's awesome. Like that. You ever have somebody be like, I met my chick there and she took half my shit. <laughs> 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 She's got her boyfriend's driving yeah. my goddamn car. I take no responsibility. For that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I really love those. I, I love that passion and, and how things work. Because like for me, I, I can only take like my own experience, Dan's experience. I mean, Dan, Dan, your first dealership, like, you were like, this is what I want to do. You freaking put your nuts out there, and they were either going to get chopped or it was going to work out, and it worked out. Yeah. I mean, I think I had, like, five grand left in my account That's after, see, like, uh, doing it, and it was, I, it was all be, of it. Be better than yourself. Every, yeah. successful, every successful business or person, granted, there's a few where they'll say, like, oh, that, that was like my family. Whatever. Yeah, a lot. Granted, a lot of there's going to yeah, be some yeah, family because yeah. for me, when I right when I retired, I started working with Boston Private Bank, and I'm not with them anymore. But when I started working with them, I would always ask, like, how did your company come to be what it is today? And I would say that 99% were, I, you know, took a mortgage out of my house, I slept on the floor, I was in the office every day. And, Every I I literally lived that business, and then all of a sudden it just boom, 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 took off, and then now it's successful. Yeah. I mean, rarely do I ever. I mean, I asked one guy like, "Hey, how this?" Because I didn't know, and he's like, "Oh yeah, my dad." I was like, "Oh, well, that's cool." Yeah. So we had peanuts. We didn't serve food that first bar. We had a big barrel of peanuts, and people would peanuts abuse that privilege. Oh hey, but they dude. would leave the shells on the floor. So I was so tired from working so many days in a row that. At the end of the night, the place would be pretty messy. If the last person would leave, I'd lock the door, grab the broom, sweep out a little spot, put my air mattress down, and just crash. Dude, that's and, awesome. And in the morning, I'd wake up, clean the place up, go to the yeah. bank, get coffee, go to the post office, pay the bills, come back, and open the doors again. I did that. And so if my people ask me all the time, like, these days, every young person sees Instagram, they see success. Yeah, they, they want to they do like, that there's, instantly. There's no get-rich-quick scheme. It's a process. There's no way to go. For, you don't want to be rich at 25. Because then what are you going to do, right? And there's no way to get there. Yeah. I, I'm now 45. I started when I was 20, 26. And 19 years later, it's a process. I, you know, I've had some success. And I could still go broke. You know, some and, success. And so, but it, it, it was a long, it's like a long hockey stick. Yeah. You know, a yeah. little curve. So it's straight, 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 straight. And then it, towards after 20 years, it starts to get a little more exciting. Yeah. And I would say, you know, your real earning years, for most people that have money, and we're going to talk about wealth and growth, business most of the money you make in your lives is from 45 to 55 yeah everything else and then it's just like a, it's sort of a, a, a you know, triple a you know you're, yeah. you're just testing yeah. yourself unlike some people you actually know what you're doing all right but you know, i would say this i would say to to combat the that <laughs> at a young age i've like i've seen guys young kids my age that were more talented, yep. had more athletic skill, had everything in front of them. Demarcus Russell. But they just didn't have the same 
makeup of I'm going to get up early, I'm going to sleep on the floor, I'm going to freaking do whatever I got to do to make sure that I literally cross every T, dot every I. And when you do that, like things slowly snowball. Because when I was living in 2007, I was living in Miami in in an extended stay hotel for the whole season on practice squad, like walking in every day to the hotel, living in a hotel, living out of a Tupperware bin in my truck. Like I didn't have a house. I didn't have a wife. I didn't have kids. I didn't have a, I, I literally lived in a hotel and lived out of a bin and I would go to the laundromat and do my, my, and everyone thinks like, if you go to the NFL, like, no, I was, I played for the dolphins, but I was on a $70,000 practice squad yeah. salary. Like, I was I came out of college, so I had no money. So it's like I was paying, I, I think it was three thousand dollars a month in in hotel bill to like stay in a hotel. And if I didn't have the 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 mindset of like I'm gonna beat whoever I see in front of me, like I'm gonna this is a challenge. Like yeah. this guy is my competition, not only like offensively, but like this guy is in my position. What do I have to do to be better than this guy, to be better than him and to succeed? Then I I don't know what I'd be doing right now. Like I might be like nothing against it, but like I might have been back home and be like work. My dad was a welder. Like I would have been welding steel or been an iron worker. And like you can make a great living that way. But you know, for me, just like in your process and in your process, like it's a it's a no, choice it's of it's a choice of should I sacrifice right now or do I sacrifice my whole life? And for me, it was like, I'm going to sacrifice every day. I'm going to bust my ass. I'm going to lift. I'm going to run. I'm going to make sure that the guy that I'm going against, I'm beaten. The guy that's next to me, that's like in my, like I, used to, I used to go through the roster. And I think people, if you're listening to this, you should do this. If you have, if you're competing for something and if it's beer, if it's cars, if it's dealerships, you list your competition. I used to list the guys on my roster. I would say this guy's 6'3", 255, a little bit slower than me, 5'10", 5. Like I'm faster than him. I have more instincts. Like I got to beat X, Y, and Z. And if I can beat X, Y, and Z out, I'm going to be the starter. So, you know, I, I think that as a whole, when you can become successful, and for me it was at 20 four, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, I retired. Like if you can do that in that short amount of time, but then you take that and you take the mentality and you move on to the next thing. Yep. Like it's a, it's a competition within what do I got to do to be better than that? Yeah. You compete with yourself. It's like, way. it's like, what do I got to do to be better than that? It's like, I'll be on the Peloton. My wife will be like, why are you killing yourself? I'm like, cause I'm not going to let some freaking 50 year old from Indiana beat me, you know, like it's just, it's like an internal, I want to be better. I want to be better. And I see a lot of people now and I talk to my coaches like from the past all the time. And like you were saying about like a young kid and Instagram and yeah, that stuff, that stuff looks like I could put a a picture of like, like a, a row of yeah. Lord Hobo, like all these taps. And go, this guy this, started with 60 like, grand. They the, think, nobody oh, knows, okay, like, 60 grand, the, the, good. Like, <laughs> it's, it's 60 grand borrowed from people, sleeping on a floor, yeah. sweeping, they, yeah, doing your bills. That is what success eventually is. But it's not instant. It's not like today. It's not... So my nephew, Cam, if you're watching this, Cam, he's 18 years old. He's going to college. And I said, look, if you want to go try and play football, I'm, you got to bust your ass every day. You got to lift weights. You got to freaking run because there's kids in this country that they might not have to run as much. They might not have to lift and they'll be stronger and faster than you. But if you just keep that every day like mentality, eventually there's a there's a, it's like a snowball that if it was just a big ball, it's already rolling. But if you're small, you got to like work at it. And then slowly, then you catch up to those balls and then boom, you're like already better than them. And like, there'll be people that I'll go back, you know, I used to go back home and I'd be at the local bar. There was a bar back home in Chicago and like all my high school 
friends would be there and I was in the league. So they'd be like, get go, like, dude's getting, getting money. Like you're rich. Like I'm living at home. Like I wish I didn't quit at high school. I'm like, dude, it doesn't matter. Like if you would have played high school football, you think you would have been in the league right now? Like get out of here. Yeah. You know, like it's not about, it's, it's not about when you were young, like just thinking that I had the ability to make it. It's when you're young, having the work ethic yeah. to chip away and chip, 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 and then start with one, and then you go two, then you go three, start with one, then you go three, four, five, and then it then then you start seeing the the progress and how things work. And I've seen it firsthand. I know you've seen it, but it's not over. With it's not just. I no. made it. You never arrived. You never arrived. You never arrived. And if, like, you're Tom Brady, if I called Tom right now, if I said, hey, Tom, like, do you feel like you've arrived? Like, you're there. He would say, no, like, I want to do more. Yeah. What a, it's like a sickness. I love, you know, we all love Tom. And I think he gets a little bit too much fluff and pop pieces about yeah. it. But I'll say, yeah. this, my favorite quote from him is, and I don't know where he got it, but I didn't come this far to come this far. Yeah. I think about that a lot. Like, I didn't work this hard to get here. I, I got here so I could get somewhere else. And that's always going to be the case. You don't ever actually make it. You don't ever arrive anywhere. Um, you're always going to strive for more, whether it's quality of life driven or financially driven yep. or health driven. Like You don't stop because you're like, oh, okay, I have enough money I'm or here. something. Right? Yeah. Or I've reached enough for success or I have enough dealerships or I've won enough Super Bowl rings. Like, you're like, okay, that was that chapter. Now what's next? How am I going to dominate the next part of my life? Yeah. And, and that might be just I dominate at being the best at the beach. You know, like that's, it depends on what you, yeah. what you define as quality of life. But you never get there. I think. And a lot of the younger folks yeah. have this idea of what success looks like. But they don't see the hard work behind it. And they all, all realize everyone on Instagram, social media, is putting out the best version of themselves it's, at all times. And it's probably right? fake or rented so, or leased, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, what you see on TV versus who you are in real life yeah. is different. Right? Yeah. I think I think the hard part for an athlete, which I can see an athlete having an, a problem with trying to change what they know. So like, for example, when you were 19, 20, 21, 22, like you were in an industry and then you said like, this is what I can do. This is what I know. You know, you started in an industry, you're like, this is what I did. This is what I know. And then you excelled at it. Like for me or for an athlete, I can see how guys can be like, this is my, this is what I do. This is the, what God gave me. This is my athletic ability. And then at like 32 to 35, it's like, like pull the rug out. Like you yeah. can't do that. You can't, you can't play football anymore, but with saying that like I know I can't play football anymore but I know that I can compete and I can put myself in a position of of mentally trying to be better and more persistent and knowing that like every day I'm gonna just keep going at it and I'll be better in the long run because like for me it's like okay what do I want to what do I want to dive into next and I talked to you about like if somebody was getting into the craft beer business and it's 2021 they're like i want to be better than lord hobo it's like bro you miss you like that. Missed he's you missed years. that boat you missed <laughs> that like work that time because people people these days i mean listen young people these days they want instant gratification yeah. this is what I, like they come in the league and they're like i'm gonna be a starter it's like you gotta run your ass on kickoff you gotta play a kickoff or you yeah. gotta play special teams. But I have forty thousand followers. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You have to pay your dues. And I think in my generation, I'm thirty seven years old. My generation, when I came up, I was like, I gotta pay my dues. I gotta work my ass off. I gotta make sure that I do the right things. In the and I sound like an old fart now, but like there's a new young whippersnappers. Yeah. The new young generation of like, I want it now. I wanna yeah. I wanna start this today. It's like, no, 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 like this starts 10 years, you know, like 12 years. So for me as an athlete, I think that, that they, like any athlete that's retiring needs to understand that you might not be playing the sport of like hitting somebody, but it's, it's the process of how you got to be a professional because 
if you were just a high school kid that was really good, like you wouldn't have been a professional athlete without that same persistence, drive, yeah. that drive, that like hunger. So it's finding a new hunger and you yeah, know, the like, challenge for an ex athlete that is operating at a super high level is where do I put all this energy? Well, I have the passion, I have the drive, I have the work ethic, I have the success. Now what? Yeah. You know, and yeah. and also the competition. Like I imagine on some level you miss the I, yeah, of course, you miss of the course you miss miss the camaraderie. Like how, yeah. you can't replace the camaraderie no. in, in, anywhere. Well, you you, you find like minded people. So you know, for me, it's like. When I met Dan, I, I asked Dan one of my first questions, like, "How did this? How did you like come to like have what you have?" And it, and, and I love the answer of, "I was." When did you start? You were like washing cars at what? At sixteen? Yeah, and so I started selling cars. Started selling cars, <laughs> and then like slowly you're like, "I think I could do this." And then you take a loan, or you, you're just like, "I'll just, just with it. bet on yourself." Yeah. You bet on yourself, just and put, yeah, he's so putting what, all the chips in the middle. People see now is oh, he's they got see eight, eight dealerships. Yeah, yeah, he's got the cars, but and he's it's got easy. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, it's the, it's the same thing. It's the same thing with you. It's like, well, look, they have all these beers. All they have to do is make a beer, <laughs> yeah. and I put it out there, and it's good. Yeah. No, it's a little bit. It's more a process. Yeah. It's a process. Yeah. But I think that's a wrap yep. on uh, this episode. I, I had a great time. Yeah. The Juice Lord is amazing. The Six One Seven's amazing. We all know that the Boom Sauce is amazing. Dan, thanks for having us, taking us on a yeah. tour. It was great it's meeting you. Great to have you guys in. Um, we'll have pretty cool to see. If we if we ever are up on the the monster and it's us oh, three, two Dan's and an Inko. Six One Seven. Oh yeah, and yeah. six one seven. Yeah. I mean, that's that's naturally going to be there. Yeah, it's in the stadium, but it'll be it'll be lined up. Oh, I have some photos from that box that day. <laughs> I'll show it to you. So it's thirty six people in the box, all drinking six one seven for an entire game. So the amount of empties was pretty epic. From first yeah. to ninth inning, there was like oh this well, is so up in the box they let you yeah. drink past the seventh inning too. Yeah. So okay, yeah, that was great. And nineteen wasn't a great year, so you had to drink. Opening a lot day was yeah, yeah. Day. <laughs> and my dad who's. You know, my dad grew up poor in Canada. They came down when he was 11, and uh, he drinks like a beer a day, two beers a day kind of guy. And so he had a bunch of uh, 617s. He started to do the whole. Oh, he started to do the shake. <laughs> Seventh inning, I was like, hey, hey, it's then, you time know, we're up to in go. This, like, steep play section. Yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Shit in the second row. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I think that's a good wrap. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. Uh, who knows what we'll be doing at this point? But uh, visit us on uh, Golf? Twitter, Instagram. Golf? Who knows? Long Apple. drive? Do you want to get embarrassed? No. I mean, I'm not, I'm not I, an athlete. I, I really don't. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't want to be embarrassed by a non-athlete. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's like a horse. You're gonna, it's going to be tough oh, I'll for kill you in horse. Come on now. Uh, I will take you guys into the driving competition. Oh. Yeah. oh. I'll put my money in my mouth. It's for sure. Dan's in. Let's go, baby. Uh, that might be next week. But we'll see you. Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Apple, uh, Apple, Spotify, the whole nine yards. And we'll see you guys next week. 